This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 263. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everybody? My name is Mindy Jensen. I am the guest host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. With you, as always, Mr. Brandon Turner. What's going on, Brandon? How are you doing? Mindy, I am fantastic, actually. Uh, what's new with you? Um, what is new with me? My children are currently on vacation with my husband visiting his parents, and I am stuck at home cleaning the house. Uh, <laughs> you're home alone, and you're cleaning the house. I'd be like, I don't know, like on the couch watching Netflix like enjoying my time. I have like somebody over massaging my feet. Do you know about that like app where you can like choose a, a masseuse to come to your house? Like I actually have, ca- I can't get massages. I am so really? ticklish. I cannot get massages. <laughs> I've never heard of anybody having that problem. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay. I am good only ticklish where I have skin. But, okay, good. All right. Just really like the most ticklish person on the planet. Yeah, I can't get massages. I can't go to the chiropractor. Wow. None of that stuff. That's really funny. Yeah. I feel like this yeah. should be like a like if this was like a morning TV show, we would like totally have a segment called like, I don't know, give Mindy a back rub and it would just be like the funniest like <laughs> 10 minutes ever. All right, anyway. Okay, well okay, enough about so, weird no, massages. we're not going to do we're not going to do massages. <laughs> no massages. Um, I I do want to go back and say I am cleaning the house because I am decluttering. And my children are collectors of everything. So when they're not home is the best time to declutter. They have so much crap in their rooms. They're not going to miss it. I, but I if they see that. me taking it out, then they will all of a sudden develop a deep longing for that <laughs> item that they haven't looked at in six That's months. Funny. I actually do that to my wife as well. Like I go into her closet. I'm like, <laughs> oh. she has not wore this shirt in two and a half years. Just like, here's my, this is my actual system. And she doesn't listen much to this show. So she probably won't hear this. However, I did want her to listen to this one. Maybe I shouldn't say it. Anyway, I'll like take her shirt <laughs> and it, I'll take it. I'll throw it up on top of like this huge shelf that she can't reach, but I can oh, cause I'm tall. You're so mean. And then if she doesn't say anything for like six months, then I know I can throw that shirt away later on. Cause she has like, she'll buy like a new outfit every week so that our closet just explodes all the time. So I just selectively throw things on top of the closet. And then once in a while when she hasn't complained and if she complains about it, like, where's that green shirt? I'll be like, Oh, it was right here on the floor of the closet. I found it, you know? So that's kind of my plan. Is that weird? (laughs) Uh, yeah, <laughs> except I do that exact same thing with my kids. I don't okay. just throw it away. I, or I donate it. If it's usable, I donate it to the Goodwill, but I put it in the garage and let it sit there. And if yeah. they don't see it in the garage and they don't ask about it, then yep. they don't need it. There you go. They asked about some baby doll carrier, like a year and a half after I tossed it. <laughs> You didn't need that, sweetie. No, you didn't. All right. Well, let's get to today's show. Uh, As much as this is a very funny, weird conversation, uh, and my wife is going to kill me (laughs) if she hears this, but uh, I'm going to call her. Today's show is fantastic. Uh, It's something that I'm really interested in, and that's raising money from, from large groups of investors to go buy apartment complexes. I mean, really, like... This is like how to buy an apartment complex 101 uh, today or how to syndicate an apartment complex 101. You guys are going to love it, I think. Especially make sure you stick around to the very end. Uh, Bruce tells a story about like a heartbreaking yeah, heart, story, a heart heart attack inducing yes. story. As he was telling it, my heart like <laughs> dropped. Yeah. Oh my god, how it, do you get out of that? Yeah, it's like fi- think of 5 million dollars in a wire transfer vanishing like and having no idea what happened stay tuned for that you guys are gonna love it but before we get to that story and bruce and all that good stuff i want to cover today's quick Quick tip tip. and kind of a reverse order that was good that was pretty spot on yeah we harmonize really well we should be in a band together no i can't sing I love to sing, you can but I harmony. cannot sing you can sing the, the the harmony and i'll sing the melody and we'll have a band called the bigger pocket I don't know. That sounds like a good name. The Bigger Pocketeers. The Bigger Pocketeers. Ooh, I like that. That's what I call everybody when I make an announcement on Mm. the Bigger Pockets forums. I call them deep peeps. That's what I say. Anyway, what? Announcement? An announcement. Okay, quick tip. On the Bigger Pockets forums. Yeah, what's your your announcement? That leads me to a quick tip. Quick tip. The quick tip is we have an events and happenings forum, real estate events and happenings forum at biggerpockets.com slash events. And today's quick tip is attend an event. If you don't have an event in your area, what are you going to do, Brandon? I am going to sit on the couch and watch TV. 
Well, don't be a loser like Brandon. Start an <laughs> event if you don't have an event in your area. There I you guarantee you, unless you live in a town of one, I guarantee you there is a real estate investor or someone who would like to be a real estate investor in your town or the next town over. They'll drive to you. They will. If you have a real estate in, meetup in your area, go attend the next one. I'm going to one tonight. I'm going to the smart real estate meetup, which is wow. South Metro something real estate, something uh, hosted by Brian O from the local bigger pockets forums. Oh, wow. um, I'm go- we're going to go to living the dream brewery. We sit around and well, we stand around, talk about real estate and drink delicious beer. That sounds like a lot of fun. So it I can be there. Fun. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry you couldn't be here too. You should come visit more often, Brandon. I haven't seen you in like a hundred years. All right. The last time I saw you outside of FinCon, the last time I saw you, the last time you were here, I was out of town and Brian, Brandon's like, oh, I almost called you Brian. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Brandon's like, oh, I'm going to sneak into town when Mindy's not here. That's what I used to So that's do. okay. I was in New York at another meetup. Oh, oh. I just hop around the globe going wow. to meetups <laughs> because they're so much fun. So. Uh, later on in the show, we talk about going to meetups. Bruce hosts a meetup, yep. and uh, he created one out of thin air when he couldn't find one to to uh, go to. Or no, he was he found some. He went to Ria's. Yeah, and then he made his own, and and then he created his own, conjured it up out of thin air because he's Mr. Magic Man. There you go. And <laughs> and I lost my train of thought again. Well, Got it when that's, that okay. Happens. that's okay. That's okay. Every show. Let's just bring in Bruce because Bruce is awesome. So Bruce is a serial syndicator of large multifamily properties, uh, Central Texas, ranging from 120 to 290 some units. He was actually awarded the Austin Apartment Association's Independent Rental Owner of the Year in 2016 and the National Apartment Association's Independent Rental uh, Owner of the Year for 2017. So he's a have big you deal. Ever won that award? I have not, you know. Uh, he's actually Bruce I mean is even better than Brandon. He is much better than me. He actually went from college dropout to over 900 units, which is a pretty crazy story. So you're going to hear all about that today. Uh, without further ado, and I'll say this before I bring him in. If you've not yet left a rating and review on the podcast, you should totally do that. Go to iTunes, leave us a rating and and or a review. All right, let's bring in Bruce. Bruce Peterson, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast, man. It's good to have you here. Man, I'm doing great. I'm so honored and excited to be on with you guys. This is great. Oh, good, good. This should be a lot of fun today. Uh, so I, I want to talk about your kind of history. You know, you and I know each other a little bit. You know, we hung out, uh, was down in Austin back a few yep. months ago, and I learned a bit about you. And uh, I remember we were sitting on this table, like, before the event. We were at a GoBundance <laughs> event before it started. And, like, I don't know, you had a broken leg or something. And, like, I don't know, everyone was, like, serving you food. I don't, I don't remember. Well, I was told by Mindy to tell the world that Brandon Turner broke my leg. Oh, okay, good. Uh, but, no, <laughs> hiking in Park City, I broke my foot. So oh, I was okay. at a boot when you saw me, yeah. You were, you were. And so yeah. we, uh, we hit it off. And, uh, anyway, I'm excited for everyone else to kind of hear your story. So why don't we begin at the very beginning, because it's a very good place to start, as uh, our good friend from Sound of Music would say. How did you get started with real estate investing? Well, you know, my story is probably similar to a lot of people's, but uh, grew up very, very, very poor, um, came out of high school, barely squeaked out of high school, thought, okay, I'm supposed to go to college now. So I went to college. All right. College did not work for this kid, right? I'm, I'm a lifelong learner, but I am not a guy that can sit still in a class and really stay focused. So I dropped out of college, became a stockbroker because that's what I was going to school for anyways. That worked until it didn't work anymore. 23 years old. We go to war in 91. uh, Can't almost give stock away. I'm a full commission broker. So I started going hungry. So then I find a guy that says, look, I can help you. I can get you out of all that stuff. And he lured me into retail. Yay. Retail Retail what? Retail, uh, actual retail, a big box store, Best Buy, Bed Bath & Beyond. Home were Depot you working Lowe's. there? or? Yeah, I started working there Oh, okay. Um, after being a stockbroker. So I did that for about 18 years and then hit a wall. Working 100-hour weeks makes you hit a wall pretty quickly. So <laughs> I just walked away from that. Um, and I sat down at the computer one day and tried to figure out how to learn more about this stuff. And I started reading and learning and teaching myself real estate investing, a few books, uh, worked with a mentor or two along the way. And they taught me how to do this with a retail background, college dropout. Uh, I started in 2011, bought my first property in 2012, uh, 48 unit. Uh, I'm a syndicator. I've syndicated every deal I've ever done. And currently we have closed five deals. We currently own four 
uh, almost 900 units. Wow. Okay. So you started. Sorry, go ahead, Mindy. I was going to I was going to ask him to clarify for the people who don't know what a syndicator is. What is a syndicator? A and then you can ask your question. I will. All right. So as a syndicator, I pool other people's money together and I go out and I purchase a property, manage a property. Basically, a syndication is any time that a deal you invest in something with a syndicator with the expectation of your profit or your loss, hopefully never a loss, but your profit resting on the shoulders of one person and one person only, right? That's a syndicated um, security is what it is. So I'm, you could call me the general partner. I'm actually called a syndicator or a deal sponsor. So I raise money from other investors. We go out and buy a property. I run it. I have my own management company. And then I send out quarterly distribution checks to the silent partners or basically the limited partners. That's okay. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, so, th so this is something that I want to get into more and more of as we go forward. I'm actually doing my very first sort of syndication right now. Um, and I mean, I'm very, very, I'm a general partner, but a very small general partner in the deal. Um, there's a couple of guys that are uh, actually doing most of the work, but I wanted the experience. I wanted to get, you know, uh, the credibility so I could do future deals. So anyway, so I, I, this is why I'm, I'm pumped about this. And I think a lot of our listeners, that's where they want to head someday. Now, what's interesting though about your story is that you did not do what most of us do. Most of us right. start with a single family house or maybe we get a little bit risky and do a duplex, you know, like it's like, ooh, <laughs> right. me, I'm a dangerous, you know, you're just like, nah, ask you that 48 unit. Boom. Like, can you walk us through that mentally? How, why and how you did that? Well, you know, I came into real estate thinking like most people think two to four single family homes, buy them, pay them off over 20 to 30 years and live off the cash flow. Luckily, I found some people that were doing what I was trying to learn how to do, and they said, why, why are you doing that? That makes no sense. First of all, don't ever pay off a piece of real estate, ever. And I agree with that completely. Not having your personal residence, don't do it. But secondly, they made me realize that I had the skill set to run one of these deals. I had, you know, this, I hope this doesn't come across as arrogant, but I've got the personality to be able to go out and kind of sell what I've got. Um, so people, I have the ability to get people to like and trust me. Um, I'm very candid. Um, so I decided to go ahead, right on, right off the bat, a 48 unit property, and, and it's the best thing I ever did. If I ever did single family, I married into a duplex three and a half years ago. My wife had a duplex she brought into the marriage. That duplex took more of my time than a 120 unit property I have down the street from it. it so it's just such a no brainer. Like Cardone said on one of your podcasts, go as big as you can safely go immediately. I like that term safely. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, oh. it's, it's smart because like, all right, so most, I actually drew this out the other day and uh, people listening can't see the drawing and I'm not going to draw it now, but like basically real estate investing is often like a uh, exponential curve, right? So it starts kind of slow. Yep. You might buy one unit, then one, and then two, then one, then two, and then maybe you get a four. And then eventually you get eight, 10, 15, 30, 100,000 units, right? It, it Absolutely. scales. Now, if you start with the one, you might go 10, like I did. I mean, it took me 12 years to get to, 50 units or so. It took me like 10 years now I've been doing this to get to 50 units. This year though, I'm buying a hundred, like this month, I'm buying like 120 units. Like, <laughs> so like I've like tripled my portfolio in the course of like in fall 2017, here we are, uh, or into winter 2018, I'm tripling my portfolio. Had I started there, then I could go and exponentially grow from that point. Uh, exactly. And yeah. So, so in the, my last two that. years, yeah, my last two years alone, we've closed 860 units in four properties. Wow. Because like you said, once you get systems and processes, and that's what a lot of you hear, a lot of what you hear on the Bigger Pockets podcast, systemize things, create yep. systems and, and processes. This thing gets easy. It really does because now we're hiring, you know, we've got corporate staff now that they handle a lot of the back office stuff. And then of course we have property staff. They handle the property. I'm basically the CEO with the vision at this point. So we can move really, really quickly now and it's become much easier. So this is another thing I love as I'm looking more and more, and I know I'm hogging all the mic again, Mindy, but uh, That's new. <laughs> this is what I love about syndication is that like, you know, in, in larger deals, the infrastructure is built into the deal. I said this recently, yep. I think maybe on a podcast, like when you're buying a duplex, I'm competing with, let's say Mindy, who's going to buy a duplex, right? So Mindy is going to self-manage it and do all her own work. And so she can afford to pay way more money than I can. So like we're not on level field, playing fields. Like when I'm buying my duplex, I I don't want to do the work. I don't want to do it. So I'm competing. But when you're buying, I mean, 
you're buying a 48 unit apartment, you're not doing the work. When you buy a hundred unit, 200 unit, 300 unit, you're not doing the work and nobody is. So you're not competing with other Joe Schmoes who are doing their work, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. But let's take it a step further. You're in a single family rent house, right? Where most everybody needs to start. That's totally okay. But in a single family rent house, this is basically being spoken to the people that can't get away from single family because they're scared. All right. So let's say you have a property that pays you two to four hundred dollars a month in free cash flow. Okay. You have a water heater pop. That's eight hundred to a thousand bucks. That's three to five months of profit gone. I I don't have that problem. I have a built-in expense um, uh, pro forma, basically. So I know what my expenses are going to be, and it takes all those blow-ups into consideration. So I don't get blindsided and lose four to five months of cash flow in multifamily. It's much safer. Yeah, Yeah, I like that. Let's rewind a bit. You said, you quoted Grant Cardone, go as big as you can safely go. Correct. What do you mean by that? What is What does that mean exactly? Okay, so you have no experience in real estate, but you just got your mind. I saw Bruce did a 300-unit property. I'm going to get a 300. No, that's not safe. That's <laughs> reckless. And you're usually never going to be able to do that anyways. Your lender will never let you do that. Now, having said that, you could bring a key principal or a guarantor to the table with you that has experience, and you may be able to get that loan now from a lender, but it's still reckless because you have no idea what you're doing. You know, your first one, even if you're going to go big, don't go probably above 24, 48, maybe a 60 unit property as you learn the business, unless that person you bring along with you as a guarantor is going to be able to do it with you. So that's what I mean by safely. Don't, you know, can I do it? Yes. Should I do it? Probably not. Yeah. I think that's smart. And, and that, honestly, that's why, again, like I, I jumped into the syndication deal. I'm not going to make a whole lot of money. I'm a very small piece of a general partnership, but I am clinging to everything they're doing. I'm involved in every email, every conversation. Essentially, I'm getting mentored by people who have done this before and learning along the way. That's my way of getting into a larger deal safely. Yeah, I'm not just right. jumping in. Right. So on that 48 unit property that I bought, it didn't it come anywhere close to paying my bills on a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. But like you have said before, I'm going to butcher this probably, but your first one is a throwaway, right? Yeah. Run it effectively, profitably, and efficiently, but you don't expect it to you know, change your life like that. Like, oh, now I could just sit on a beach in Cozumel and drink Mai Tais. It's not <laughs> going to happen, right? So that first one, just get something small, but then as soon as you can, sell it, okay? A 48-unit property is great. It's better than a single uh, rent home, but that 48-unit property with two part-time staffers is tremendously harder to run than the 300 unit I just purchased. So even sell the first 48 or 60, 72 unit property, get yourself above 100. Now you have qualified full-time staff and it gets even easier. Well, let's talk about that. Why why is it so much easier to run a 300? Because that sounds counterintuitive. 300 units versus 40. 40 sounds way easier because there's less people. Right. Okay. So there's less people, but again, it's all about staffing. The bigger you get, the more qualified the staff is and the more staff you've got. So if you've got a 48 unit part-time staffers, right? I got a part-time manager and a part-time maintenance guy and you know, you're interviewing. Oh yeah. yeah, I want to work for you part-time. No, you don't. You can't find full-time. So you'll work for me until you find full-time. So it's a never ending carousel of staff. It sucks. It's really hard. Um, but you get into a 292 unit, which is the one I just closed. Now I've got three bodies inside. I've got specialization. I have a leasing agent, an assistant manager who does all the bill pay. Well, most of the uh, rent collection, I should say, in collections themselves. And then I've got the property manager and I've got four staff outside. So now specialization, higher quality staff, and again, much, much easier. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Okay, that. so how did you pay for this 48 unit? Probably Again, I'm a, syn- first time. Is it the I'm a syndication. Okay. Right, I'm a syndicator. Now, I bought it in 2012. You syndicated your first deal. Yes, I've always syndicated everything. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, so the first one, now remember, this was 2012 in Austin, Texas, right? I bought it for $34,000 a door, $34,000 a door. Um, and I had to raise $575,000 to bring to the closing table, basically. Of that, I put in 20%. I put in $115,000 of my own money, and then I raised the balance of the money from 14 other investors. So, you know, I've got math teachers that were in that deal. I have a private investigator in that deal. I've got a lot of tech guys in that deal. Again, you just got to find people that like and trust you and that you like and trust. 
and it's a great business um, for scaling, definitely. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's, that scares a lot of people, right? Like, I don't know people. I don't know. Like, people say that all the time. I don't know rich people. I don't hang around with rich people. So I can't go and syndicate money. I can't go raise money. Even on a small deal, I can't find a single private lender to help me do my, my flip. What do I do? So okay. I'm going to jump in here at first and say there's a lot of people that you know that have money that just don't sit there and announce it. Yeah, that's true. Right. So let, let's start with one thing and we'll go into a second part of that. All right. So you said, I don't know any rich people, right? You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, right? Yeah. Level yourself up. Don't walk away from your friends or your family. But in these endeavors, trying to build a business, level yourself up. If you walk into a room and you're the smartest person in that room in the endeavor, get out of that room. Yeah. You have to find a way. And I know it's not easy, but you have to find a way to start to run around in the same circles as the rich people you're talking about. What I did, uh, I was lucky. I started in real estate, uh, kind of, I guess you'd call me retired at 43 because I saved my money to live way below my means. But still, I came from a retail background, right? There are not a lot of rich people in retail. Yeah. So what I did is I created a meetup, right? We always talk about that, right? Yep. I created a meetup. And it started with me and one other person in 2011. To this day, it's still going. Now, I've turned over the mail list to somebody else, a friend of mine, Mike. But that thing has grown to about three to 400 people. We meet every other Wednesday. And we have anywhere from 30 to 40, maybe 50 people that get together any one Wednesday. That's where my people came from. We got to spend quality time with each other, get to know each other. We started going on a boat together. We started barbecuing, going to dinner together. They got to where they felt comfortable with me, even with no experience. They were willing to entrust me with their first. And uh, most of them, it was their first investment as well. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, there's so much there we can, I mean, like go into. But I, I will say this. Uh, if you are interested in hosting a meetup, like Bigger Pockets gives makes it really, really easy to do that. If people go to biggerpockets.com slash events, E-V-E-N-T-S, and you can find a local meetup in your area, some a bunch of real estate enthusiasts getting together, or if there's not one in your area, you get to be the Bruce and get to go start one or get to be the hub. You know, like that is such a good place to be when you can be the hub because people are coming to you for answers and a lot of them have money. Right. Yeah. And like Mindy said, a lot of people have money. They just don't talk about it, especially in today's world, right? Like the stock market's crazy high and everything's really exciting, you know, but people are nervous. Like, oh, the stock market... How much higher can it go? Do I want to crash my, any day? Yeah, right. And so everyone's <laughs> pulling the, like there. If you can be like, hey, look at this real estate deal secured by real assets. That's real cash flow. It's coming in. Like there are people out there who want to work money. You know, I, I talk about this thing called like a uh, lately I've called it the deal triangle, though that's a horrible name for it. Basically says like you need three things to invest in a deal. You need uh, money or you need knowledge or you need hustle. And you only need two of those. In other words, if you can have the knowledge of how to do this and the hustle, you don't need the money. The other people can bring that part of it. So just pick two, knowledge, hustle, or money. And that's kind of what you did here. I mean, you had a little bit of money to put into it, but nowhere close to the amount that you would need to buy it. You just brought the hustle, you brought the deal, and uh, you made it work, which is awesome. Right, because everybody else that was in the deal, they still had their own lives to lead. They were either grandparents, they wanted to hang out with their grandkids, or they're traveling. Most of them still had a job, though. This was a good way for them to passively invest, right, for that passive income. So hopefully someday, you know, they'll be able to walk away from their job because they now have enough passive income. And in fact, of those 14 first investors, I believe three of them, five yeah, about five years later, they have walked away from their job because they now have enough passive income to live. That's awesome. It's incredible. Wow. That's very Bruce cool. is put Bruce is making people unemployed <laughs> left and right. <laughs> yeah. In a good way. I'm costing jobs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Bruce, Go ahead. do you have any tips for a hosting a meetup? You said you started with one other person. Well, that's what it was. I started with one other person and then people that I would run into because you got to plug yourself into a local scene, if you will. Right. So I started going to any and every, uh, I think they're called RIA meetups, you know, real estate investor meetups that I could go to. And anytime we would go on it anywhere, people that were interested in what we were doing, trying to do the same thing, we would just have a conversation. Oh, and Hey, just to let you know, we meet every Wednesday at Starbucks. Hey, I'd love to come because what happens to a lot of people, you find a group or you find a, a specific like, uh, I guess, a cohort that you meet with once a week, once a month, maybe once a quarter. If you don't have a way to consistently stay engaged, 
you're going to lose your steam because a lot of people around you are going to be giving you all that negative crap. Oh, it's a scam. Oh, my cr- crazy Uncle Vinny did it, and yep, he, yep. he didn't make any money in real estate. Well, quit talking to that guy, right? <laughs> he didn't do it right. Talk to people that are doing it and doing it effectively. So that's the biggest thing is you've got to keep yourself – together. So I just started dragging people into our little ecosystem and it just mushroomed because everybody wants to connect. Yeah, that's a Makes great point. Sense. Everybody wants to connect. Yeah. And we have uh, we have three or four local meetups in the Denver area and I'm going to one tonight. And every time you go, you come home and you're like, I, I can't wait to invest in real estate. I want to go find another deal. I want to go analyze more stuff. Yep. So yeah. yeah, those the events are really, really, really encouraging. They're really inspirational. They're really, you know, they're such a great networking space. Absolutely. It, it, we, it, none of this would have happened for me without it. So yeah, it was, you know, to be hyperbolic, it was pretty life-changing. That's awesome. No, that's great. So w- what happened to the 48 unit deal? You still own it today or you, did you sell it? No, we sold it two years and four months in. Okay. The plan was to hold it for five to seven years, but then the Austin market happened to us, right? Okay. We were, we operated very well, but then prices just ran away. Uh, we sold it two years and four months later. Our total return was over 300%. <laughs> Again, I saw right away a 48 unit was much too difficult for me to to really it, – well, okay, it wasn't too difficult to run, but I knew there was an easier way. I knew if I can go bigger, it's going to get easier, and I'll scale faster. So I had to sell the, the small one. And I had a couple of my partners say, oh, 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 oh. We, we're, we're in this for the cash flow because we're trying to retire ourselves. Yeah. Okay, Okay, guys, think about this. I can give you a 10% return for the next five years, or I can sell in three months and give you nine and a half years of cash flow all at once. <laughs> it's up to you. And they went, oh, okay. I never really thought about it that way. And if you structure your business the right way, for some people, you don't even have to pay the capital gains because we didn't 1031 into the next property. Um, one of my biggest other investors, he paid no uh, – what, what did I give him? I gave him a $249,000 check at closing on a $100,000 investment. Wow. He paid no taxes on that. Why so is that? if you, well, because he had enough losses and he was considered a real estate professional because okay. he owned some single families on his own, right? So now he's a real estate professional. So he can take all of these paper losses that you see on your K-1. Now, this is getting really, really deep, right? But he had real estate losses through depreciation yeah. from a lot of his other investments that he could offset that $149,000 profit that I gave him. Yeah. So he paid no taxes. That's awesome. Yeah. And yeah. you know, this is obviously not the show but for tax tips, but like just in general, I love to just tell people like the government seems to really like us. And so they reward us in a lot of ways. There are a lot of ways that real estate investors are getting rewarded. They're still working out right now as we're recording this, they're still working out the the coming tax changes. And I heard that some significant thing happened this morning. I don't know. I haven't read the news yet, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, but either way, generally speaking, the government likes us because we're, we're providing housing for the world. So they reward good behavior, which is right. Uh, so think currently. about who your president currently. president is yes. right now. Yes. Right? <laughs> He's made his money in real estate. Yep. Most people in Congress have or do own real estate. Yeah. So it's in their best interest to keep it kind of the way it is. I don't think it's a bad or corrupt system at all, but I don't see them changing these laws anytime soon. Yeah, it was sense. proposed. It was proposed to change some of the 1031 and some of the homeowner exemption, but I really hope that doesn't go through because that's yeah. how I invest. I yeah. live in my flips. So although I do participate in these syndications. Um, So let's talk about the next deal after the 48 unit. Okay, next deal was again in North Austin, 120 units this time. Um, It's just, you know, it's funny. It was a property that two of my friends actually looked at. For whatever reason, they decided it wasn't for them. So I was like, okay, I want to take a shot at it because, you know, it's a small industry, basically. You get to know a lot of the players in the market, not all of them, but two of my actual close friends looked at this, so we don't step on each other's toes. I stayed out of their way. When they decided it wasn't for them, I stepped in, I bought it, um, and it's been a great investment for us. Um, you know, it's location. That thing is between, it's so densely populated in this area, it is between two elementary schools, one on either property line. There's a oh, wow. church in front of me. There is a big grocery store behind me, and there's a bus stop on my fence line. The location couldn't be better. It's in kind of a rougher area. It's a C-minus neighborhood, so very working class. But my location allows me to have the highest rents of the neighborhood stay about 95 to 100% full all the time. 
That's awesome. Can you can you explain yeah. for those who don't know what is a, what did you mean by when you say a C minus area? What are the class? Can you talk about the class systems inside of a real estate deal? Right. So you go different versions of A. You got A, A plus, A plus plus, but then you got a B, C, and a D, and all of those classifications have a a minus and a plus, right? A B plus, a B minus, and a B. It's basically dictated by the age of the property, the rents per square foot, and the amenity package that it has. There's no exact science to this, but a C property is, so A is the best, D is the worst. I don't want any part of Ds because they're usually filled with drug dealers and prostitutes, and you've got Rottweilers running around off-leash everywhere, cars on blocks. I don't want any part of that. C class, a lot of people will call it workforce housing, and that's what this is. They're really, really good people. They just are kind of locked into that kind of a neighborhood because of the jobs they have, because of the schools that they want their kids to go to. Um, and then you get into a B. You're getting usually a B is you know late 80s into the 90s. And I give you rents per square foot, but that's so wildly different by market. So it you know, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go into that. But now you're getting some better amenities. You've got a pool. You've got clothes, a uh, laundry care facility. You might have a gym, uh, might have a clubhouse. And then you get into the A's, that's all the new stuff. That's usually five to 10 years old or brand new. And, you know, they've got, you know, the dog valet, they've got dog walkers, they've got massage therapists on staff. So that's what an A is. All right. That makes sense. So first of all, I always think it's weird too. They don't have an F. I think they should have, this should be A, B, C, D, (laughs) F, just like school, you know, but whatever. No, why don't they have E in school? Does anybody ever, I have no idea. I don't remember. I actually, (laughs) I actually remember getting. An having e. an E in, in no, I didn't get an E. I had, I had an E. They they used to have E's and now they Did don't. They? That's weird. Brandon's like nine, so okay. he doesn't. <laughs> no, I want to. I want to hear that. I want to put out a call to everyone listening to the show right now. There's you know hundreds of thousands of people listening. If you know why they don't have an E, will you let me know over on like Twitter or something at Brandon at BP or hit at Bigger Pockets? I want to know. <laughs> uh, or what's your Twitter, Mindy at Mindy at BP? Mindy at BP. Mindy at BP. And Bruce, are you yes, on Twitter? I copied you. Uh, not very actively. So I mean, you're not a 13 year old. Peterson no. BB. Okay. Yeah, Bruce Peterson BB at Twitter. All right. So, all right. So I want to know why, but anyway, so, uh, so you're buying this one with C minus. Are you fixing this, these and other properties? We'll go through the rest of them later, but are you fixing them up or are you buying them already like fairly nice? For the most part, they are. Well, okay. So I buy them in good condition. I buy fully stabilized assets in my part of the country, in my part of the state, most of the inventory that was beat up very lots of deferred maintenance, not operated very well in 2006, seven, eight, all that stuff's hit the market been turned around, put back out of the market. So most of the stuff that I find to buy right now are fully stabilized assets, but I still usually come into the, the, the property and I can still make some improvements. And then with our operational prowess, we can dr- definitely drive value through our operations. But yeah, you know, on that property, I added a, uh, a huge barbecue pit area, right? I put two campfire style barbecue pits there with two uh, picnic tables. Because when I got there, I noticed that there were grills everywhere on the property. Of course, it's it's against fire code, first of all, but also it's going to burn down my dang property. So I don't want that. <laughs> so I figured now I'm going to come in. I'm going to be the new sheriff in town. They're going to be mad. I tell them to get rid of their barbecue grills. So I had to create something for those guys. Um, and it was a huge, huge hit. Uh, we replastered the pool. We cleaned up signage and did some landscaping around the entrance, the pool, and the office. So we didn't have to do a whole lot because it was run pretty well when we got it. Okay, that's cool. And uh, where are you buying all these in in Austin? Austin and San Antonio, basically my backyard. Okay, cool. Uh, We didn't talk about numbers for this property, this 120-unit C-minus property. What did you buy that for, either total purchase price or per door? Uh, 81,250 a door, I believe it was. And the purchase price was 9,750. Okay. So, um, we've held it for a little over two, well, no, right about two years now. Um, so again, we've done really well with it. We've, you know, raised the rents to $250 a unit since we've had it. Um, so we've done it exceptionally well. And of course I get hounded all the time by people wanting to buy the thing, but I'll tell them, look, I'll sell to you, but, uh, you're not going to want to pay what I want. Well, don't try me. Give me a two cap. <laughs> Like, oh, oh, what? It's like, exactly. I don't want to sell it. So that's the way you get people off the phone that are hounding you. Give me a two cap, I'll sell it. That's funny. Nobody will, nobody will do that. So why <laughs> why don't you want to sell these? Um, I mean, like we look at the market 
the market seems really, really crazy nationwide, especially down in Austin. Like, like why would you not want to sell? Well, because again, we're buying stabilized assets that usually when you buy a stabilized asset, you're going to pay retailer very close to retail, right? So there's not a huge value add component. Yeah. So you can sell, but it's not like you're going to make this big profit at the end. So why not just hold it long term and just get more and more and more profitable every year you have it? Now, eventually, yeah, we will sell it. Um, but, you know, when I think the time is right, I'll bring it to my partners and we'll discuss it and make the decision we think is right at that time. Oh, so what does long term mean? What does hold it? Are you looking for five years? Are you looking for 25 years or is there no set time? Five to 10 years usually. At okay. five years, a lot of times, a lot of your systems, uh, your major systems have to be readdressed. Uh, the roof might need some work. You might have to repaint something. So there's more capital uh, projects that you need to invest in um, about five years in. And most of the loans that we're getting now are seven, 10, and 12-year loans, right? So my anticipated hold period is somewhere between seven and 10 years. And we'll just look at the market every year to make sure that that thing, that thesis is still in place. Um, and, and we'll just, we'll address it every year. So are you fixing up these properties before you sell them? Are you putting in the the money and then selling a, a stabilized property or are you, I, I don't want to say ditching them, but are you like, like when you, sell, when you plan to sell, yeah. <laughs> when you plan to, when when you plan you, to sell, yeah. So, that's no, no. not the right way to say that, but. Well, since they're not value add properties where we're going to double and triple our money in two or three years, you know, I'm just going to run the property from day one the way I want to run the property when it's time to sell. Oh, now let's pretty, no, I don't do that because I do everything I think I need to do on the front end to make it a better place for people to live, right? So 192 units that I bought right around the corner from this property we're talking about now uh, I noticed in my neighborhood, there were no properties with covered parking. Okay. I'm not going to wait until it's time to sell. I'm going to go ahead and do it now because I can reap the benefits of the added revenue because I turned 25% of the parking spots into covered spots. And now there's a premium, you know, a, there's an inherent premium there. So now I charge $40, 45 bucks a unit for these parking spaces. So I'm going to do that right away anyways. Um, so, you know, we don't wait. The plan is never to wait until it's time to sell. And now let's put a lot of stuff into it and make it look pretty. I want it to look pretty, as pretty as it's ever going to look the day I buy it, because, you know, I got to have street appeal. I have to have people wanting to live there. So we'll fix it right away. That's smart. I never really thought about it or talked to anybody that does that. But I know like when I, whenever I live in a, like a house, you know, my own primary residence, I tend to not fix it up all the way until like the day I move out, you know, like that's the day it is beautiful. And I'm always kicking myself going, <laughs> I could have lived with this. You know, why did I wait to put yes. in the granite countertops till the day I move out? And uh, yeah, you might as well enjoy it. Right. Well, there's another school of thought too. So not just the exterior, but you go into interiors. Everybody's talking about unit upgrades and value add because, you know, the current owner saw that 10% of the units are running for an extra hundred bucks if you'll spend $3,000 to upgrade that unit. So there's a big thought now that if you are going to institute a unit upgrade policy or program, you probably don't want to do more than 20 to 40, maybe 50% of the property because in today's market, that's a big part of the value I'd left for the next guy, right? So now you can say, look, I've done 30% of the property, let's say, but there's another 70% of the property. You can come in and keep this upgrade program rolling and now they feel like there's enough meat on the bone for them to want to take it over and drive some more value out of it. That's smart. I like that I, a lot. It's giving, giving the next guy a little bit of room. In fact, I think I even heard Cardone say that one time. Maybe it was on our show or somewhere else. But yeah, giving giving meat on the bone for the next nice guy. I think that's very smart. Well, it's easier to sell the property when you're doing that too. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. All right. So um, I'm curious about like the way you structure these deals in terms of like you're syndicating them. So let's talk about that a little bit. What, I mean, like how much do you get? I mean, is this 50-50? Do you get a, like, or the 80-20 that you get 20? I mean, how does that work? Um yeah. It's usually an 80-20 split or a 70-30 split. Now, if the deal is such that I think I need to offer a little more incentive to get investors on board with me, I've gone as low as 85-15. Okay. Right? So, but because to the, to date, very seldom have I ever done an acquisition fee, a disposition fee, a promote fee, a waterfall on the back end. I keep this very 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 simple. Because the more and more complicated you make this, the harder it is for a potential investor to see the value and be able to follow how this is all going to work. So again, I don't fee them to death, but because of that, every deal that I've ever done, people have been okay with not getting a preferred return. 
So I don't give preferred returns. Now, someday, maybe I'll have to. I don't know. But to this point, I've never had to give a preferred return. We share on every distributable dollar that goes out to the partnership. Now, we'll have our portion of it, too. But then our premium, that 85, 15, 80, 20, or that 70, 30, we participate in all of it. But on the back end, we don't cap the investors on the back end. You know, we all share the exact same way at the back end. So I, again, I try to keep it very simple and very equitable for them because I want them to have, if it's a pleasant experience for them, they're going to follow me to the next deal. Yep. So I've got a question okay. for those that are listening who don't know, what is a preferred return? Okay. So a preferred return says, let's say the preferred return is 8%. I guarantee, well, you, okay, yeah, you basically, it is a guarantee. It's preferred. So I, as the syndicator, don't get my premium, my 80-20 split on any dollar that gets distributed until you as an investor get an annualized 8% return. Okay? okay. So in that case, let's say the property itself is returning 10% profit. We'll, we'll call it, right? Your cash on cash return is 10%. I have an 8% preferred return for the investors. So the first 8%, I don't get any 80-20 split of that. It's the 2% on top of the 8% that now we will split the 80-20 or the 70-30. So that's what that's dealing with. Okay. Okay. So how do yours... How do yours pay out then if there's no preferred return? You just 80-20 from the very beginning or whatever the numbers are? Every single dollar. Yeah. And it and they come out okay. Because again, I'm not going to charge you a 2% acquisition fee, a 2% disposition fee. You know, I'm buying $20 million assets. That's a $400,000 fee on the front end that I don't charge people. Yep. And so because of that, now we're all on the same page, right? We make money together. Um and the incentive for me is to make money so I can uh, so I can take that 80-20 split or that 70-30 split. Um, There's something else I was going to say, but I forgot what it was. Oh, and, and so just a little more depth there. Let's say the property over five years averages a 7% return and the preferred return is 8. Well, I don't have to pay them the 8% return if the property can't handle it. But when I go sell the property now, I have to make up that shortfall of an average of 1% per year from sale proceeds, that after I do that, then we take our 80-20 split or 70-30 split. But since you don't do a preferred, it's just, it's always just flat out, you know, you either split at 80-20 or 70-30 or whatever the thing is, which I, I like the simplicity of that in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, I do too. What I, what I find fascinating is every single time we talk to somebody who does syndication, I mean, every <laughs> single person we've had on the show has done it differently. There's never been two the same. <laughs> absolutely absolutely it, it, again it, it's so much easier for them to understand they don't yep. try especially you get into waterfalls like oh yeah. my god their eyes glaze over you start talking about irr you know there's certain yep. terms that a lot of people don't understand so i try to again i try to dumb it down the best i can because most of my investors are still going to work you know again yep. they're math teachers they're tech guys they're you know, if I overcomplicate this thing, they're like, okay, it's probably a good deal for me, but I'm going to walk away. And my average return to a a passive investor is going to be seven to nine percent in today's market year one. That's cool. so it it works out. That's a really great point. That if it's so confusing that they're not going to understand it, they're just going to walk away. There's no point in raising all this money and then not being able to collect any money because nobody wants to deal with your yep with your weird splits. I don't even know what a waterfall is. Basically, for the first X percent of profit, we take 80 percent. Well, let's say 20 percent. Then the next you know, portion above that profit, well, we're going to take 30 percent of that. And then if we exceed you know, a 2X profit, well, then now we're going to take 50 percent of that. It's a waterfall. So it's it basically is implemented in stages depending on how profitable you are. And again, it's very, very difficult to follow that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that doesn't make any sense at yeah. all. When I was putting together, you know, I, th this past year, my goal was to buy a mobile home park and I was going to syndicate it, or at least I thought. So I was putting together this big, complicated waterfall number analysis. Like, <laughs> I mean, I spent. Because that's weeks. what you're supposed to do, that's right? That's what you're supposed to do, right? Like, <laughs> exactly. that's a lot of the big guys are doing these huge, really complicated things. And uh, I think it was I called up my buddy, who I know you know as well, Andrew Cushman. And I was like, Andrew, help me with this. I don't understand. He's like, just don't worry about it. He's like, just don't do a waterfall. You don't need it. Just go and raise money and. You know, split it with people who can't, like, and I, it, it blew my mind when you said that because I was like, oh, I don't have to get fancy. Like, well, you don't have to get fancy. And usually the people that are getting fancy, mm -hmm. it's because, you know, I hate to say this on some level because a lot of my friends do this, but a lot of times it, it boils down to greed. It's like, come on, man, a 20, an 80 20 split isn't 
enough for you, <laughs> you know, and, and don't try to squeeze every dollar out of an investor in nickel and dime them to death with everything to get as much money as you can out of this. Because again, they're going to enjoy the process with you. They're yep. going to appreciate your openness, your ability to follow the money, basically, and they're going to keep investing with you. So now that first 48 unit property turned into the next two properties for me, right? So that would basically spawn three properties. That's awesome. Most all of my guys followed me into the next deals because, again, I made this very, very pro investor. Yeah. I yeah. Love that. And that's, and you still made money. We made a, ton of money. I mean, you personally, <laughs> you, Bruce Peterson, still yeah. made money. Yeah. So I put in 115. I walked with $289,000 a day we sold. And then we had all the cash flow while we <laughs> held it too. Right. Wow. Yeah. Now, uh, again, Those yes, I'm brilliant. I'm not going to say I'm not brilliant. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> Please, well, thank you. But look, the Austin market happened. I'm very good at what I do. But look, we just capitalized on a crazy insane market is what happened there. Yeah. Because we yes. thought we bought a fully stabilized asset that was going to just generate a 10 to 12% return every year and then sell it because we thought we paid retail for it. Sell it, you know, make a little money on the back end. But, it, you know, it goes back to that thing. Hit a bunch of singles and doubles. Don't wait for the home run. They're almost never going to present as a home run. Yeah. You know, I thought that was a single. It turned into a grand slam home run. That's, awesome. <laughs> That's really good advice. Yeah. That's very good advice. So are you still putting money into all of your deals Absolutely. or do you? Okay. Absolutely. So you have skin in the game. I think that's important in a in a syndication. I invest in syndications and I want to see the sponsor, you know, having something to do with it just other than their reputation. I mean, your reputation's great, but I want to see you yep. making right. money too. We have losing money. The whole family's in. Uh, my sister's involved with us, my niece, our two girls are in the deals with us. Um, but now to be fair, there some people won't put money in their own deals. And there there can be a very, very good reason for that. Because as a syndicator, I'm the guy putting my name on the loan. I have to have a certain amount of liquidity or I can't get a loan. So sometimes you will see some syndicators not put money into deals because they're trying to hold back and build their cash reserves on their balance sheet because they need it to sign for the next loan. Mm. So it's, yeah. it's not terribly common, I don't think, but it does happen. And there are legitimate reasons. I agree. I feel more comfortable if you have some of your own skin in the game that you risk losing if you don't do it well. But I do believe there are some times where it does make sense for a syndicator not to put his money in the deal. But make sure you understand why. Ask them. You know, hey, look, I'm thinking about giving you 10000 50000 a hundred, a quarter billion dollars of my money. Why are you putting no money in the deal? If they can't answer you or refuse to answer you, just walk away and find another deal. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's really good advice. Okay, so you really quickly, you said that your two girls are in the deal. How old are your girls? Well, okay, so let's let, let me explain that a little bit. You know, I said I married three and a half years ago, right? I've got uh, – her, at that time, 15-year-old daughter asked me to adopt her. So now I have a, a, an nice. adopted daughter. Don't make me cry. Stop. Um, <laughs> so I adopted her. She's 18 now. And her sister is 22 years old. Um, so they have their own money that they invest. The first investment we got them involved with, involved in about four, maybe five years ago, with, it was with friends of ours. We invested $16,000 each in this deal. And just like my first deal, that first deal, the day they sold, they got a $50,000 check on a $16,000 investment. So they tripled their money as well. Nice. And then it's just been mushrooming from there. That's nice. Fantastic. I love the idea of getting kids involved. I mean, everyone knows I talk about Rosie all the time. I do too. I, my kids really don't like real estate right now. They're eight mm -hmm. and 10 oh, yeah. and I'll be driving them around. I'm like, look at that house. They listed it for this. Can you believe that? And they're like, mom, we don't care. <laughs> yeah. Our, our, uh, our youngest daughter, my, my adopted daughter, she works for our management company actually. So we try to make it as nice. much of a family affair as we can. So, well, we're teaching her what it is to own and run and manage a business because, you know, she wants to start her own company, her own business. She wants to design and, um, market her own clothes line. So she's learning very, very valuable stuff and contributing to the income she's producing through these assets. So it, it, it's a great thing. We, we really enjoy having her with us. I love that. That's, that's awesome. I am really hoping that I can get my girls into real estate when they get you know old enough to be able to sign legal forms. Um, yeah. They cool. can't do that right now. 
<laughs> so Bruce, how are you finding deals today? I mean, what are you, uh, brokers? Brokers for the most part, it's just, it's relationship building, right? So I've had one slid to me as a, an off market deal, you know, it was pre marketing. So they were going to go to market, but they brought it to me first and I decided, yep, I want it. So we got it. Um, uh, my first deal was found on LoopNet, and you always hear people rail on LoopNet. Oh, that's where good deals yep. go to die or bad deals <laughs> go to die. That. Yes. <laughs> right. But, but it's not true. Okay. In large part, it is true, but there are gems every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. That's where I found my 48 unit property. So it's that thing, you know, but most of them are found just publicly listed stuff, you know, with all the big brokerages in my part of the country, uh, all the big guys operate down here, but what I do to differentiate myself, it's not just where am I finding the deals? How do I close the deals? Because a lot of times I'm going up against multi-billion dollar uh, corporations. And, you know, I'm just a little dude down here in Austin. How am I getting these deals? I get that question all the time. It's about, you know, it's like we were talking about with your investors. The same thing. Be a good buyer. Let the seller think they got over on you. You know, let them think they won the negotiation. You don't have to win. You win the negotiation if you get his dang property. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> yes. be a good. Yeah. I am very, very easy to get along with. I don't push back. I don't retrade. Right. So I don't renegotiate a deal. A lot of people I know, they'll get it under contract for $10 million, knowing that at the end they're going to offer nine, no matter what they find. Yep. It's a way to lock up the property because now I'm the highest bidder. And then, you know, right before my due diligence period is up, I'm going to renegotiate for a million bucks. Yep. I've never done that. I hope to never do that. Because again, I don't want people to feel bamboozled and, you know, kind of jerked around. So they bring me more and more deals. I've bought deal more than one deal from the same people often. So, you know, be a good, good buyer. I love that, Bruce. And I love you for saying that. Because <laughs> I love like, you too. like I'm not I'm not hitting on you. But I love you for saying that because there's a lot of people in the uh, in the forums in the Bigger Pockets forums that say, "Oh, I just get it under contract and then I'll just, you know, I'll re renegotiate." They don't say they'll nickel and dime them, but they nickel and dime them. Be honest in your negotiations. Yes, there are ten million dollar properties that you find a million dollars worth of stuff that you have to renegotiate the price for. But just going in knowing that you're going to renegotiate is you're being shady. Right. Don't be don't, shady. There's enough deals shady. to go around. The last property I bought, 292 units in San Antonio, purchase price of $23.2 million. The guy on the phone, because you know, when you get into these bigger deals, you oftentimes have an interview on the phone with the seller, right? Anytime I've gotten to that point, I've never lost a deal. I've won every deal if I can get in front of them, you know, so to speak, on the phone. But he's like, okay, Bruce, you're somewhat of a smaller operator. We're a billion dollar company. Why, you know, why am I going to give it to you? And that's what I told him. I said, look, I'm bringing in, in enough money to know that if something gets discovered during feasibility, during our due diligence period, I can deal with it. So I thought what needed, what was needed at first look was about $200,000 worth of rehab. I brought in $700,000 worth of rehab because I didn't want to retrade the guy. And I told him that. I said, it has to be egregious. If I see it's a $500,000 roofing job, okay, we're probably gonna have to talk about that, Rick. But you know, short of something that catastrophic, I'm, I have enough contingency to make sure I can deal with whatever I find on your property for the most part. So you have my word, unless it's just, unless the deal just completely falls apart, I am not going to retrade you. He gave me the deal and he called me afterwards. He said, look, I got to tell you, I was scared to death. You only have a handful of deals. You're a small guy. He said, I'm not trying to be rude, but I am always worried when I give deals to people like you. Are you going to get scared? Are you not going to close? Are you going to nickel and dime me? He said, I'll bring the next one to you too. Like, oh my God, see, wow. it works. It works. Nice. Yeah. If you're a stand up person, you're going to get rewarded for that so much more than that million dollars you might have saved. Exactly. Cool. All right. Well, Bruce, this has been fantastic. But before we go to the fire round, I'm wondering where do you see yourself going in the future? Where's the next five, 10 years look like for you? Uh, you know, on my whiteboard here in my home office, across the top of it, I have scrawled $100 million. <laughs> right. That's my, that's my net worth goal. Uh, how am I going to get there? I'm not quite sure, but I will get, there. I got to have a plan, right? Yeah. Be worth a hundred million dollars. I want at least 5,000 units because I enjoy everything we do. We have our own management company, so we can just keep pulling them in and it gets easier and easier to add them more and more corporate staff. So I would like at least 5,000 units and my ultimate goal 
is not quite Gary Vaynerchuk goal. I don't want to buy the New York Jets, but I do want to own a double or a triple A baseball team. And this is an avenue Ooh. to help me get there. Yeah, that that's what I'm looking for. I like that goal. Yeah, that's cool. I don't, <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to own baseball. I'd own a football team or go Mark Cuban and own a basketball team. Yeah, but then you're only playing in the majors, right? So in, in uh, baseball, I can buy all, it, you know, there's all kinds of minor league teams. There might be some of that stuff for football and basketball, but I don't think there is. So you just have to go straight to the NBA or the NFL and pay billions of dollars. I could buy mine for 20 to $30 million. So a little more attainable. Just, just 20 or $30 million, you know. Well, well I, I mean, come on, that's the size of the properties we're buying right now. <laughs> I so I have this goal of winning the lottery. So when I do that, I'll, I'll, by a major league team. Oh, you're you're that person, huh? <laughs> That's how you're going to take care of yourself in your older <laughs> years, right? I would win the lottery, or I want to sue somebody. Uh, please have a better plan than that. <laughs> when my husband was working, he was working with this person. That was their retirement plan. Legitimately, they were just going to win the lottery. I'm like, really? Like that's not a joke. You actually, they actually said that. He's like, they were serious. That oh, was yeah. their plan. I've seen the same study done multiple times, probably three or four different times over the years. And they poll people, you know, thousands and thousands of people. How do you plan on uh, taking care of yourself in your in your golden years? The number one and two answer that I've typically seen on this poll is, number one, I'm going to win the lottery. And number two, I'm going to sue somebody. <laughs> That's disgusting. Yep. That <laughs> is disgusting. Yeah, it is. It is. It's probably not going to happen. And if you say, don't come take my stuff, go get your own stuff. You can do it. Everybody can do what I'm doing, what you guys are doing. You just got to go do it. Don't try to take somebody else's crap. Go get your own crap. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm going to correct you. It's not probably not going to happen. It is not going to happen. You are not going to win the lottery. I have no, a friend that actually won a million bucks in the Texas lottery. So. <laughs> I can't exactly say it's not going to happen, but it's probably not going to happen. That's so it's funny. not going to happen to you because you know somebody. Lottery yeah, so winners don't know each out. other. Yeah. Right. I went to high school with Mike Morfoot and his dad won like the most money in the Illinois lottery at the time. Wow. Uh, I think he won like $26 million. Now so you, you my, my shot. Long, though. Uh, yeah, he took the the like long-term payout i think this was a hundred years ago when that 20 years was the only <laughs> option wow oh. all right well let's <laughs> let's head over to the world famous fire round fire round it's time for the fire round all right this is the fire round these questions come direct out of the Bigger Pockets forums, which of course you can get to by going over to biggerpockets.com slash forums. And uh, if you're there, Mindy is like there like 24 7. Mindy, I don't think you leave. Yeah. Like, uh, does Josh, no, I'm there all the time. Does Josh still have the laptop chained to your leg? Is that still like a thing? <laughs> it, it's removable, but <laughs> okay, well, he's good. got the key. Okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, these are questions from the forums that real life people have been asking. And we're going to ask you, Bruce. Number one, how do I vet a syndicator? Okay, so this is always a funny question because a lot of people will say, oh, you know, go find people that have worked with them in the past. Ask them for a list of – no, don't do that. If you are trying to vet somebody and you say, give me a list of the people that have invested with you that I can talk to. Let's say they have 100 investors. 97 of them hate everything about their <laughs> being. They, they are actually suing them right now, let's say. But three people – or on his payroll, and he, they love him. Well, you're only going to hear from those three people. That's true. I know it's difficult if you're not investing with somebody kind of in your local area to do this, but I highly suggest find other people just organically. Hey, what do you know about Bruce? Oh, I've invested with, well, what do you think? If you go ask Bruce for a list of investors, you're going to get the only three people in the world that like him. So that's my biggest thing is just try to find people that have invested with them and find out, you know, it, because they can lie about their bio even, you know. Yeah. How do you know how to check up on their track record? Find people that have invested with them. All right. 
I like that. That's that's a really good point. And I would like to say that you could ask in the Bigger Pockets forums. Hey, has anybody ever done business with Bruce Peterson? If a hundred people say, Oh, he's a schmuck, <laughs> listen to those hundred people. If a hundred yeah. people say he's really awesome and one person says, Oh, he's a schmuck, maybe that one person didn't know what they were doing or you know, had a fight with you at a bar or something. I don't know. It doesn't just because somebody answers doesn't mean that they've actually done business with you. But look at the general trend of the question when you or the answers when you're asking. Right. But then you have to follow what you just heard, too, because I've had some people say, well, everybody seems to not like this guy. But my God, this deal is incredible. Don't invest because yeah. a terrible person is going to ruin a great deal. Right. So if you don't like and trust the person that you're thinking about investing with, no matter how good the deal looks, just go away. There are so many deals out there and everybody's scared. I'll never find another deal. Yep. If you stay engaged and plugged in, you're going to find other deals. So don't get nervous and don't make reckless decisions. That Very is good. so perfect. Yep. Yeah, okay. All right. Next okay. One. As a syndicator of commercial real estate investments, what would be the benefits or detriments to the syndication business of becoming a licensed commercial real estate agent? How can deals be structured or agent broker arrangements be negotiated to minimize constraints and conflicts of interest with the growing syndication business? Well, that was a long question. Okay. <laughs> I'll just give it, I'll give you the best answer that I have. I'm not a real estate broker or an agent, never will be. I have no interest in doing that. This is more rewarding and it's a lot more profitable too. But the one thing I do know, and I've heard this from a few people, your fiduciary responsibility is through the roof now, right? If I'm a realtor, you're held to a completely different standard than me, who is not a board member of, you know, the apartment, I mean, not the apartment associate, but the board of realtors or whatever that is. So I think myself, you'll, you'll get some learning from being uh, an agent or a broker, but what I think is that most of what you're going to learn is going to be selling retail stuff to other people. It's not going to help you learn how to invest in stuff. I don't think it's really needed. And oftentimes I think it's maybe even a bad idea to get your real estate or broker's license. And a lot of people think, well, think about that. I will be the syndicator. I'll get an acquisition fee and then I'll get a commission. Look, there's enough money to not have to convolute everything. And that almost has like an air of impropriety. You know, yeah. it, it feels weird that you're holding all, I wouldn't do it. All right. I, I okay. Think, I think I'd agree I, that's, that. a, that's a great answer. It is. All right. Number, number uh, third one. I've read so many good things about syndications and investing with syndicators, but I'm baffled as where to find a syndicator. I'm guessing due to the relationship aspect of the business, it might just come down to who you know. Like, is there a website like syndications are us or something like that, that I can <laughs> find people to put my money with? Well, there are there are websites, Realty Mogul, Realty Shares. I'm probably in trouble for plugging somebody. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, they they do exist. But for the most part, if you're just wanting a list of individual syndicators, okay, first of all, it's SEC stuff, right? So I can't, as a syndicator, just broadcast to you that, oh, hi, my name is Bruce. I'm a syndicator. Let me show you this deal. That's against the law, right? You can't do that. Now there are ways that you can do it. Depends on how you register with the SEC. But for the most part, you're not allowed to just go around telling everybody what you do and please give me money. You have to know people. You have to have pre-existing relationships with people on most of these deals. So, you know, short of going to one of the websites that actually takes a cut of each deal that gets run through their system, there's really not a better way to do it. All right. Cool, cool. Um, also, I would just add a lot of people, you know, meet people like they hear them on the bigger pockets podcast and they they they're a syndicator they're not they're not advertising to come on our show they're just talking about the story but a lot of times you can get a lot of stuff just by listening to not just our podcast but just podcasts in general it's a good way to kind of hear people's stories and i mean we probably had i don't know a hundred people who raise money on our show so just you know listen Right. And again, we talked about it before. Engage. Stay yep. engaged in your local community. Go yep. to the meetups. You have to get out. It, it, there's not just some special Google search you yep. can do and have this magical button up here. You got to get out there. It's right. It, it's hard work. But the hard work is go talk to people. Go yep. meet people. <laughs> it's hard. If you're an introvert, it can be difficult. I understand that. But you got to figure out a way to just get involved. There you go. You'll find them. And honestly, yeah, for, and for introverts, the forums is a really good spot. Like if you don't want to yes. go in person, engage in a forum. It's a lot easier when you're an introvert. Absolutely. Well, and I was going to say, uh, if you're listening to this show, chances are really good you're a huge real estate geek. So 
you like real estate. Other people at the meetups like real estate. Hey, what kind of investing do you do is a great icebreaker. Let people talk about themselves. They just want to sit there and yammer on. Yep. Exhibit A, brand, exhibit B, <laughs> Brandon. Um, what are you so, talking about? I don't talk. What? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, go to the meetups or the forums are a great place. Ask a question. Answer a question. If you have knowledge, somebody else doesn't and they need yours. Right. There you go. So, okay, enough of that. Last question. Um, I'm thinking about putting my money in with the syndicator, but when looking over his numbers, I feel like he's too low on estimates for the rehab. What should I do to ease my fears? Well, I mean, how? why do you think he's too low? What knowledge do you have that that person doesn't have? Uh, you know, there are people that I run into that are giving advice. There was one lady on a forum I saw one day, won't mention what forum it was, but, you know, somebody asked a question. I forgot what the question was. How do you do this in multifamily? And this person weighed in and said, look, I've never done it, but I've been studying for three years. And uh, this is how you do it. Like, what? Who are you taking advice from? But now on this, where are you getting your knowledge from? The syndicator, chances are they do this all day, every day of their lives. They're very experienced at what they do. Yeah. So I I'm not saying that you're wrong by thinking that they're too low, but you know, you, you got to start asking questions. Um, again, you're potentially giving to give somebody a lot of your money, ask questions you need to ask, um, and just hope you can get a good enough answer. But if you don't have the knowledge yourself, I don't know how you're going to know that they're not doing it right. Unless you have some experienced people around you, you can show some of the stuff to them that you're looking at. Yep. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, so this question was a good friend of mine asked me this question actually, like, uh, and <laughs> Yeah, he's talking about a syndicator who I know has done probably hundreds of syndications, if not dozens, many <laughs> dozens, right? And I looked at my friend. I said, exactly. I was like, you've never, you've never done a rehab in your entire <laughs> life. This guy's done dozens of <laughs> these massive apartment complex rehabs. Like, I, I mean, like, yes, there's a point where you have to trust people and you also need to question it. But like, like this guy was about as legit as you can get in doing syndications. And again, my buddy has never, ever once done a rehab of anything in his life. Doesn't know how to use a hammer. So anyway, it, <laughs> it was an interesting conversation. But he didn't, he didn't do the deal. He did not go in the deal because he was afraid of the, 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 the number was wrong. But. See, and that's the thing. There are so many engineering brain people in this industry that are trying to be in this industry anyways. And they feel because of their training as an engineer that their job has to have a contingency plan for everything. And it has to fit in a box a spreadsheet. Well, not all that's going to happen in this industry. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. And they get themselves so locked up. Well, what happens if, you know, we have a terrorist that, okay, okay. Well, what if there's, you know, anthrax shows up on the property? Well, look, that's possible, but it's probably, it's improbable. So people just got to get out of their own way. Yep. I love that. Hey, one more question. This is just my own personal in the fire round. What kind of software do you use to analyze? Well, a couple of things. One, do you, do you use like a spreadsheet to analyze or do you pay for a software? And the second question is what do you use? Uh, what kind of software do you use in your business to manage just your, your business? I do spreadsheets. Um, yes. so I don't like subscribe to any kind of service there, but for the properties we use, uh, we've used multiple, but the best one that we found so far for us has been Resman, R E S M A N. Okay. Um, you know, it's very robust. It's not as expensive as some of the bigger ones like Yardy and One Site, uh, which are great programs. I've never had them, uh, but I've talked to people that have used them. Uh, and Resmin is almost, if not as robust as those. And I usually pay about anywhere from a, a buck fifty to maybe two dollars a unit for the management. Uh, uh, for the software, depending on what I want it to do. Now, it can facilitate emails for me, texts for me, uh, credit collections for me. It can do, uh, there's credit builder stuff. There's all kinds of stuff that you can a la carte it up to two, three dollars a unit, but it's usually about a buck fifty to two bucks. All right, cool. All right, um, I guess with that, why don't we move over to the Famous four. Famous four. Right. That was off. That was <laughs> These are the same four questions we ask every guest every single week. Uh, and so I know you've heard them before, Bruce, but let's go through them. Number one, what is your favorite real estate related book or a recent favorite? Uh, you know, it's the seminal one, right? That everybody talks about rich dad, poor dad. It just changes mindsets. It, it helps you understand what you're doing wrong. If you want to really get ahead and have a phenomenal life. All right. What is your favorite business book? 
And this is kind of a, a cop out in a way, but you know, uh, call me a fanboy if you want. It's okay. Gary Vaynerchuk, dude. Anything that guy puts out, I'm all over. Crush it. Jab, 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 right hook. Crushed it. Um, he's just phenomenal. He cuts through the crap and he tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. So I love everything that guy does. So actually, we're working to get Gary here on the podcast. So just, oh, wow. I don't know if it's going to happen yet, but we're, we're working on it. So. We'll wow, see. Good Stay tuned you. in the coming weeks. But I know he's got a book coming out, and that's the best time to get people on the show. And yep. uh, yeah, so absolutely, we'll see. All right, number three. Mindy. Do you have any hobbies besides real estate? See, I'm that I'm I'm bad about this, right? I'm the one track mind guy. I think about this stuff all day, every day. But my wife and I, we like to travel. We like to go hiking. And then my nerdy thing, I've been playing fantasy sports for 30 years. So I'm a big fantasy sports guy, baseball and football. I am currently in last place in our office fantasy <laughs> football team. Wow. Team <laughs> Luther. <laughs> but it's still fun, right? Yes. And also, you are talking to two people who live and breathe real estate. And 150,000 people are listening who also live and breathe real estate. So nobody's... Nobody's looking down on you for having this be your all day, every day. That's my <laughs> thing, too. It's better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What do you think sets apart successful real estate investors from all those who give up, fail, or never get started? It's conviction and courage. You know, have conviction and, and trust in you and your own abilities, right? You know, when I got involved, I was a retail guy for 18 years. I'm like, I, I don't know anything about this. Well, the, the skills that I developed leading people my whole life conveyed very well into this industry. So most of it, we talked about that engineer brain, that extreme type B personality. Again, you've got to get out of your own way. You have to have conviction and courage. Things aren't going to be perfect. Every deal I do is a good deal for the most part, but things still happen in these really good deals. I've had uh, a division of Homeland Security take five million bucks of my money. Didn't tell me they took it. They just took it. Whoa. You know, we had to figure whoa, it whoa, out. Whoa. We had we, a we dead guy in our pool. That I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we dead, gotta see, dead guy gotta and five story. million stolen. Yeah, we have to get these two stories. Okay, so first one, you know, a property we closed about six, seven months ago. I got a text and an email one morning um, sitting in my home office, and I looked down at the text, and my lead maintenance guy thinks he's doing me a favor by showing me what he found this morning. It's uh, unfortunately, it's one of our residents oh, that man. we have him on camera. He jumped the fence at our pool at four o'clock in the morning, inebriated. You could tell he's just kind of almost falling over the whole time. He goes swimming and never comes back up. Oh, so, wow. you know, we have to deal with that stuff. We had so again, it's not always going to be perfect, but we get through it. But, you know, that day, then I went and spent the whole day with my staff. We reached out to the um, to the family that still lived on property. So, you know, Things are going to happen, and it's so unfortunate. But for people that are wondering, do I get – if you don't think you can stomach that stuff, you know, this is probably not right for you. Find somebody that you can invest your money with. Mm -hmm. But, okay, so the other one was we're buying a 256-unit apartment, and uh, I go into the bank Friday morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, execute my wire transfer for $5.2 million. I drive to the property, and I'm kind of hanging out waiting for the phone call to say, okay, it's cleared. We're good to go. Well, 11 o'clock hits, nothing's happened. The previous management company had already come in and taken out all the computers, all the phones, everything. The staff that we're about to inherit has nothing to do their job with. Remember, I am the management company also. So I thought, we got to go in and set some stuff up for them because the, the wire will be there any second now. Two o'clock comes. Everybody's screaming at me on the phone. Where's this wire? Like I did all the backtracking. And it left my bank and went to the Federal Reserve at like 9.30. Three o'clock hits, nobody's seen it. Four o'clock hits, the seller screaming at me through his attorney to my attorney. My attorney's screaming at me now, like, what, what the hell's going on? So finally, my attorney calls me back and says, look, you got to get out of there. Like, what are you talking about? She goes, you don't own that property. I'm like, oh, crap, you're right. We don't own this property. So we had to leave. Nobody knows where the money is. It's gone. Nobody can find it at all. So we leave the property and my CPA wife really doesn't know exactly what's going on. She just knows suddenly we don't have a property and you got me out of there and we're driving we're driving away from the property. So I had to tell her what happened. She starts to hyperventilate. I think her get a couple of drinks. Yeah. It helped. <laughs> but what ended up happening, anytime you execute a wire transfer, it leaves your bank, it goes to the Federal Reserve. 
the Federal Reserve gets it and they start looking at it. But then they have other fingers get in that pot. There's a division of – I think it's a division of Homeland Security. It's called OFAC, O-F-A-C. And what they do is they look at that wire transfer to make sure it's not coming from or going to a known bad actor. So when they come in and they look at this, the name of the property was the same name of a known terrorist organization in Colombia. <laughs> so, oh. of course, they take my five – Go <laughs> after it. We're laughing now, the but best. they just took my 5.2 million bucks, and they don't. There's not some friendly little uh, like customer desk. service yeah. division. <laughs> exactly, you're Mr. Peterson. We don't know what's going on, so we have to go home that night. It's Friday evening. Sit down at the computer and tell my investors, "Hey, guess what? You aren't owners like we thought." Oh, it it gets better. I don't even know where your money is. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a fun thing to have to explain. Luckily, the president at the title company thought, wait a minute, I think I remember this happening 10 years ago. So he started making some phone calls and he figured it out for us. And when we did actually close that Monday. So again, wow. it can get very white knuckled. If you don't have wow. the stomach for that, don't do this. It's fun. <laughs> it's rewarding. But my goodness, does it get stressful sometimes? That's the best story I think we've ever oh had. Oh my told god, I can't even <laughs> like my heart hurts right now hearing that story. I I do a lot of wire transfers and I didn't know that it went to the Federal Reserve. I'm I'm not sending it to uh drug cartel estates or whatever the name of your company is, but wow. Well, the, the seller's losing his mind. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I did not name this property. You changed the name from X to Y, and Y is the name of it. I was like, look, it's it's your fault for calling it what you called it. And I was like, quit getting mad at me. But yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun experience. Wow. That's amazing. All right. Well, <laughs> with <laughs> that, uh, final question of the day, Mindy. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I just I closed my <laughs> Where where can people where Yes, where can people find out more about you? APT-GUI, basically apartmentguy.com. So apartmentguy.com, APT-GUI.com. Or you could also get me at info at apartmentguy.com. You got to get the dash in there or I won't get it. At I will put a link in our guy. show notes. All right. Yep. App-guy. That's it. All right. Good deal. Well, uh, with that, you know, man. This has been awesome, Bruce. Uh, I, I learned a ton, and I, this always just gets me like hyped up and excited to do syndication. So Come on, you. dude. Let me know when you're ready to roll. Let's do something together. I, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. We will do it. So, uh, yeah, anyway, keep in touch. And, uh, thanks All right, for guys. Being part thanks of the show. so much. Oh, All man, right. it was great. Thank, Thank you, you, Bruce. Thank you. All right, and that was our interview with Bruce Peterson. Man, I, li I like that guy a lot. Uh, not as much as you love him, apparently, but, you know. I uh, love him, <laughs> and that – my heart dropped when he yeah, told that $5 story. million dollar wire transfer story. So that when he first said that the wire transfer was gone, we have a friend, yep. uh, Shannon Allen, lost her wire transfer. It was stolen because somebody broke into her email. And I thought she lost $50,000, which is horrible Whoa. to lose $50,000. But $50,000 is nothing compared to $5 million. Yeah. And when Bruce started telling that story, I'm like, oh, my oh, God. No. yeah, That's a horrible story. And then I'm thinking, wow, I do a lot of – wire transfers I, I don't want them to take my money of that's, course i'm not that's like quick tip of the day actually is always verify your wire transfer number before you oh, ever send one. that yeah, is that's an tip. excellent quick tip quick bonus tip. quick tip yep call and i even put that in my new book how to sell your home Ooh. i put that tip in there call your title company and verify yep. on the phone that you have the right numbers Ask them if they're going to change because they're not going yep. to change. Your title company has the same bank account from now until forever and from the beginning of time on. It's not going to change. They're not going to send you a, an email at 2 o'clock in the morning that says, oh, hey, sorry, we gave you the wrong number. They yep. didn't. There you go. By Verify. The way, Wire did your friend get the 50 grand back ever? Is it just gone? She actually did. This is like the, she got conned by the dumbest con man ever who left the money in the American bank account. Like she was really? using Chase and he was using Bank of America or something. So he pulled her money or she transferred her money to him and then he just left it sit there. That never happens. When wow. you are transferring with a scammer, as soon as it hits their account, it is whisked away to some offshore account where it yep. can't get touched. So she actually did in the only instance of 
this ever happening in the history of the world, she actually <laughs> got her money back. But That's it was, awesome. oh, it almost would have been better if she would have lost the money altogether. She's had so many problems with that house. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, some flipper did it and then like did everything. Uh, how do I say this? Half Halfway. Halfway. I was going to say good. half something else. Yeah. He did everything halfway. <laughs> And it rains inside when it rains outside. And oh, it, there's just a lot of issues. So wow. I hope she gets all that sex fixed soon. I'm yeah. thinking about you, Shannon. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Shannon. So right. with that, Brandon, thank you for letting me step into Josh's shoes today and yeah. uh, take over for him. I always love to do that. Um, I will see you again soon. All right. Thank you, Mindy. And thank you, Bigger Pockets audience. We'll see you guys around. Uh, in the meantime, make sure you guys leave us a rating and review and jump into the forums and interact with people, meet people like Bruce or Mindy or me uh, hanging out in the forums. And come to my next live webinar, biggerpockets.com says webinar. I host an online class every week teaching different topics. So who knows? Maybe this will be talking about something that you really want to learn. Biggerpockets.com says webinar. All right. The webinars are really good, Brandon. You do a thank great you. job with those. Thank you, Mindy. I like doing them. I like teaching. It's like you know what you're talking about. I might. All right. It's like you've done this before. Okay. <laughs> I may for, have. For Bigger Pockets, this is Mindy Jensen, over and out. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.